Greetings and welcome. Welcome to tonight's program and happy anniversary to the Brooklyn Bridge. Exactly 140 years ago today, May 24th, 1883, the still independent city of Brooklyn, along with the city of New York, and I dare say an entire watchful country, celebrated the grand opening of this masterpiece of engineering after 14 years of construction. My name is Marcia Eli, and on behalf of the Brooklyn Public Library, the Center for Brooklyn History, and the Library's Arts and Culture team, BPL Presents, it's my honor to bring together tonight's distinguished panel of experts and Brooklyn Bridge aficionados in conversation and celebration. We are so pleased to be partnering with the New York City Department of Transportation, and I'm thrilled to welcome DOT Commissioner Idaris Rodriguez to join me now to say a few words. Thank you. It is an honor to be here, here on behalf of Mayor Eric Gannon. A lot of respect to all the librarians. As a former social study teacher that I was for 15 years before being elected to the council and now being the commissioner of the OT, I know how important it is to stand today with, was to, was to stand today with Mayor Eric Gannon as we also reopen one of the sites under the Brooklyn Bridge as yes, part of the celebration of this great day. Last week, I also walked through the Brooklyn Bridge with the ambassador from Germany. It, it seems everyone knows that the engineer who built, you know, the bridge also was a German descent. And today I started showing a piece of, 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 of all the reconstruction that we are doing as part of the Brooklyn Bridge. You know, the first thing that I want to express is my thanks to everyone who are so committed to keep the history of the Brooklyn Bridge alive, but especially to my team at DOT that led by Paul Schwartz, our Deputy Commissioner of Bridges, oversee almost 800 bridges and tunnels that we have in the city of New York uh, under our great agency of DOT. So on behalf of Mayor Eric Adams, yeah, thank you to the Brooklyn Public Library for hosting this on time, online celebration of the incredible history of the Brooklyn Bridge on his birthday. A special thanks to all the panelists and to the library executive VP, uh, David Wallows uh, himself and a DOT veteran for helping organize this great event. I want to acknowledge that DOT is so dedicated to uh, keep our bridges and especially the Brooklyn Bridge is one of our top priority. Uh, I am proud to, and, and of the entire Bridges team, but I'm especially excited that we are joined today by Clara Medina, who is a bridge repair engineer who knows this bridge so well. Clara, thank you for everything that you do in our bridges in our DOT. I walk across, as I said before, this beautiful bridge just last week with Consul General David Gill and a delegation from Germany, from the German, Gener German Gen uh, Consul General here in New York City. On that day, I presented a break from the original bridge to honor the critical role that the Ro Roblin's proud German American play on in building this bridge. All of Ger the Germany and uh, equally the United States is so proud of the work, great work that was done. So thank you to all the panelists. Thank you to the organizers. Today is a day that the most important part the information that we will get from the panelists. So for me as the DOT Commission, it's a great day to be here in front of you in 30 seconds in Spanish because that's my native language. Eh, eh, gracias a la librería de Brooklyn por organizar este panel. Tenemos grandes panelistas y para nosotros a nombre del alcalde de Garden, es un día de nosotros decir gracias a todos los que mantienen nuestro puente como el Brooklyn Bridge en buen acondicionamiento y hoy es un día de nosotros disfrutar lo, la conversación sobre el, la, estos 140 años de Brooklyn Bridge. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Commissioner Rodriguez. It's a celebration for sure, and that's what we're doing. Before I introduce our panelists who are waiting behind the Zoom curtain, I wanna share um, that closed captioning is available to those who would like. You can turn that on by clicking the function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And I invite you all to share your questions tonight. Simply type them into the Q&A box, which is also at the bottom of your screen. So with that, it's my pleasure to give you just the top line bios of each of our accomplished guests in the interest of getting to the meat of it. Um, I encourage you to read more about all of them on the BPL website. Um, okay, so I'll bring everybody on. Erica Wagner is the author of Chief Engineer Washington Roebling, the man who built the Brooklyn Bridge, and she is coming to us from London. Richard Haw has written three books on the topic, Engineering America, The Life and Times of John A. Roebling, The Brooklyn Bridge, A Cultural History, and Art of the Brooklyn Bridge, A Visual History. Clara Medina, who the commissioner mentioned, is a bridge repair engineer at the New York City Department of Transportation. She specializes in the East River bridges, which of course includes the Brooklyn Bridge. And our moderator tonight is Kate Asher. She is currently the Milstein Professor of Urban Development at Columbia University's Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation. And she also leads a variety of transportation and infrastructure projects as a consultant to Borough Happold Engineering, where she was formerly a partner. So thank you all. Please join online. Um, and um, uh, I'm so excited to hear uh, this conversation. Thank you all so much for, for being part of this. And I'm going to turn off my video and listen rattly. Thank you. Great. Thank, thanks very much, Marcia. Um, I think I speak for us all and say that we're quite excited to be here um, as panelists. I'm excited because I'm planning to learn a lot of what I don't know. Um, so um, I think we'll just tuck right into it. We've got a bunch of questions for the panelists. And then in the latter part of the hour, we'll take some questions from the audience, either general ones or feel free to direct them um, at a specific panelist. Um, but I guess I want to I want to start by getting by getting granular um, about the, the the bridge itself um, and the fact that it's 140 today, um, which seems to me as a person who looks at infrastructure quite old for whether it's a building or a bridge. And I guess the question that I'd like to ask um, Clara, who's our DOT engineer, is how, how much of the bridge that we see today is original, Clara? And I'm wondering if those parts that are original will really last last forever. Um, perhaps you could turn your screen on, Clara, so we can I, see. I'm trying. I'm trying, oh. but it says uh, when I, it says you cannot start the video because the house has stopped. It. The host the house the house has stopped. It. That's what okay. I that's um, what, okay. Let me start my video. Let's see. We yeah. can find there, we go. there you go. Got Great. it. Mm -hmm. There you are. Thank you. So did you I'm not sure you if you yes, I hear yes, I hear Great. and I hear Great. the last part where you say it in my last forever. But uh, but this yeah, I'm, just, I'm kind of interested in knowing what parts that we look at are actually original and whether they will continue to stay on the bridge indefinitely. Well, we never had modified and replaced portion of uh, only of the main structure. Um, we uh, the uh, the iconic uh, towels. It's still original. Um, the uh, the gators, most of the gators underneath, still original. Um, we replace uh, the bridge of. In 1950, was replaced. The walkway was replaced from original to what you see today. Uh, the solid rod um, suspended. It's been replaced in the 90s, and uh, so the the solid rods that you see, they not the original ones. And also, the rowway has been modified for strengthening it to support the increase. Of the traffic, so the the um, 
the raw weight it has been modified as well too. So also the rehabilitation of the approaches too. Mm -hmm. That also is not original. But then um, the most important, all the, uh, the iconic towels, what's identified the bridge is still. Um, the, the, the structure underneath, even though, you, you know, most people just see the top. And also um, the wrapping cables, the main cables too. This original. is originals, yes. Yeah. Now, uh, to see okay. how much it can be, um, you know, the structure degrade over the time and due to factors such as weather, corrosions, and uh, physical stress of the structure, sometimes um, disintegrate with the time. But with good maintenance and replacements as it's been doing during this 140 years, you can see that the bridge um, is still carrying uh, today's traffic after all those years. Right, that's great. Thank you so much for that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's the, the authors of some great books about um, the bridge here. And most of you who are tuning in probably are aware that it was a, uh, a Roebling family team effort um, that John Roebling, who was the original architect engineer of the bridge, um, died that his son Washington took over and was injured and that Washington's wife Emily stepped in to help oversee the day-to-day -day completion of the bridge. So um, given that we've got experts on at least two of those three here um, in the persons of Erica and Richard, I wanted to, to ask them um, as we look at the bridge today, how much of it is really John how much would you say is Washington? And how much is Emily? If we had 100% as the, the bridge, how might you carve it up between those three? Um, I'd love to hear from both of you in, in either order. Shall I, shall I start? I, I mean, John, I John. Why don't you start, Richard? John didn't last very long. I mean, he lasted about three weeks into the construction and then died of a sort of tetanus. Um, outbreak. Uh, John is John's responsible for the vision and the sort of aesthetics of the thing. Um, he's also responsible. I mean, he drew up the plans um, and uh, he he came up with the sort of uh, the aesthetics. He 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 worked a lot on aesthetic for his bridges. So all of his bridges look very different, and he was always working in his notebooks um, about how to construct different types of step towers to to create an effect. And I think what we, what everyone who walks on the Brooklyn Bridge thinks primarily of is this sort of an aesthetic success. Um, the way that the, the cables and the towers work together are moving, brilliant. They, they're, they're, they're hard, it's hard to do to, to have granite and, and steel work well together um, and to have them sort of create an effect together. So the vision, the aesthetics are all John, um, I, would, I would argue. Um, although they're not necessarily without, his plans were not without fault. Um, Washington, I know, altered many small details along the way. Um, Washington, I mean, the, 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 the thing about Washington is once John goes down and, and dies, Washington is probably knows about as much as about the building suspension bridges as anyone in the world. Um, once John is sort of out of the way, so to speak. Um, so he's actually able, and John was a brilliant engineer in some respects, and he got some things wrong about suspension bridges. And actually one of the reasons why the Brooklyn Bridges required less repair than say the Covington's and Cincinnati Bridge is because Washington built it. So he changed a lot of things along the way. Um, and so I, I'm, I, can, I can say that and hand that over to Erica. I'm happy to speak about Emily later because um, I think that her, her, she was incredibly important in the building of the bridge, but not in terms of engineering in, in other terms. And I'm happy to speak about that uh, later, but I'm sure Erica is as well. Thank you very much, um, Richard. Um, and, and yes, you know, I think one of the things it's worth stressing that is so fascinating about studying 19th century engineering projects um, is how experimental they were. When we were talking about this discussion we were going to have um, before we all actually met to talk to the public, um, 
you know, we all agreed that you can look at the Brooklyn Bridge now and it's been there for 140 years. It looks like it's been there forever. It's not as big as many bridges now. It's dwarfed by the Manhattan skyline. Yet in its day, it was a, a radical, radical construction. And once John died, it was really up to Washington to figure out how to build it. One could mention a lot of things. Most significant, perhaps, though, is the construction of the caissons, the foundation of the towers, because John had never built a bridge. Use it. Very few people had built a bridge using caissons deep under the river, working in compressed air. It was brand new, very risky work. It cost Washington Roebling his health, although he did live to the grand old age of 89. Um, but it really was up to Washington to figure out how to build the bridge over the course of the next 14 years. As Richard said, constantly altering, having to adjust the initial plans that his father John had made. And I would agree with Richard that Emily's role as project manager, I would say, once Washington became sick, particularly starting around 1873, was absolutely vital, overseeing the construction, but conveying Washington's plans to his assistant engineers, and also crucially, being an extraordinary politician. She was someone who dealt with the trustees of the bridge in a way that Washington probably, even had he maintained his health, couldn't have done as well as she did. So she was an integral part of the construction, but again, not strictly speaking as an engineer. Fascinating. Um, Richard, can I just follow up on something you mentioned? Um, I was doing a little a little homework for my job here um, and came across the John Roebling Bridge over the Ohio River in uh, between Cincinnati and Kentucky. I'm afraid mm -hmm. my Midwest geography is pretty crappy. Um, but, but they tell me there's one that it's actually called the John Roebling Bridge and that it still is in use and that it's older than the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, so notwithstanding the fact that from an engineering standpoint, it might be very different given what Erica just, just told us. Um, I wonder if, you know, you can sort of maybe touch on how he segued from one to the other. It does seem the Brooklyn Bridge was a magnitude uh, more ambitious, perhaps, but but I'm not sure that's that's right. Uh, yeah, I, I, the, 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 the history of it used to be called the Covington and Cincinnati Bridge, and it's been recently renamed the John A. Roebling Bridge uh, recently. Um, it's the history of that bridge is takes it would take too long to explain it's 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 begun in the 1840s it's then put on hold until the 1850s and then put on hold again and restarted again um so the sort of journey from idea to opening is really long and it's actually very fascinating because it's the first structure to link the north with the south after the civil war and it was planned before the civil war and if everyone remembers their uncle tom's cabin um one of the great important things about politics in the region was you didn't want to have ways for uh, people to get over the Ohio River. And that was seen to be incredibly contentious at the time. Um, it is, um, I think one of the ways to, um, to compare them um, is, as Erica said, you didn't have to dig caissons for the, uh, for the Ohio Bridge. Uh, bedrock's about 10 feet down underneath the bedrock. So you just have to sort of dig about 10 feet down and, and, and the towers are set. Um, so I think the challenges, the challenges of spinning the cables are somewhat similar uh, and building the sort of the, 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 the sort of superstructure of the, of the bridge are, are somewhat similar. And it's a real testing ground. Um, the Ohio Bridge is about 1100 feet between towers. Uh, the Brooklyn Bridge is 1600 feet um, between towers. So it's a real testing ground for both John and Washington, who himself worked on spinning the cables and may have been in charge of spinning the cables um, for the Covington and Cincinnati Bridge. So it was, it was a, a way for them to sort of um, practice that on some level on a long, uh, on a long span bridge. Um, I will say one of the things that's interesting about uh, the Ohio Bridge is when it was opened, it has two main suspension cables. 
but it's been retrofitted since, as, as Clara mentioned, a lot of these bridges have to get retrofitted along the way. And now it has four cables uh, to hold it up. So um, the fact that the Brooklyn Bridge has survived with such little um, retrofitting is actually a testament uh, to how great a structure it is that the Ohio Bridge has had a lot more. Um, and I, th I think uh, the Ohio Bridge, to go back to what I was saying before, I'll just say this very quickly, is less of a success aesthetically than the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, the, it, it's, it's sort of, it's the stage on the way to understanding the Brooklyn Bridge. So it, uh, one of the things about the Brooklyn Bridge is every th so many things about the bridge carry your eye upwards. So it's got buttresses, which are a structural form, which carry your eye upwards. Um, you've, you've got the cables, uh, the cable stays that carry your eye upwards. The tower, the, the peaks of the Gothic arches carry your eye upwards. So it's all these things working in concert. Um, and the Ohio Bridge is sort of less successful aesthetically. It has a sort of rounded Roman arch uh, bridge, which doesn't quite have the same effect. It has these sort of weird spires on the top, which don't add anything. So it's kind of, it's an interesting stopping point on John Robing's aesthetic journey um, as he sort of plays with how to create an effect uh, with sort of be an architect as well as an, an engineer. Um, that's, it's also that's really important. important um, I'm, I'm probably talking too much, but it's important because uh, it, it's opened in 1867, in I think the 1st of February, 1867, and about three weeks later, the East River uh, fro freezes solidly uh, and nobody can get across and everyone panics in New York and says, Christ, we have to get a bridge built here. Uh, and whoa, this guy has just built this massive bridge over in Ohio. It's just open to great fanfare. Let's get in touch with him. Um, so um, it, it, it creates the opportunity uh, and the sort of the will. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, Clara, we've been talking about what's, what's special about um, the Brooklyn Bridge. And um, this is one of those questions that you may not want to answer. I remember, I think it was Akmar Aman or another bridge builder once talked about looking out from the top of a tower in New York and seeing all his children, which were the various bridges he designed. And I'm, I'm going to ask you as the representative of DOT Bridges, you have hundreds of bridges that you look after. I don't mean you personally, but you and your colleagues. Right. So yeah. um, what, what in, in your mind um, or in the department's mind makes this one special? I'm assuming that it's special just because we're all here tonight, so we must think it's special. <laughs> but but from a from your standpoint, from DOT Bridges, what would you make say makes this one so special or so different? Uh, well, we do care here in DOT for all our long span bridges on the East River with the same level of concern, um, and we have it implemented a lot of programs like a painting for all of them, preventive maintenance for all of them, program for all of them, including lubrication, debris removal, uh, mechanical um, sweeping, um, drain cleaning, bridge washing, but the Brooklyn Bridge, and also that is besides the other, like you say, almost 800 that in-house we go and do, um, other repairs, uh, but the Brooklyn Bridge, we do some kind of activity that is just done on the Brooklyn Bridge. They make it very unique, and that is the rod, um, the solid rod. This is um, how can I say? Not only the suspended bridge have. No, the other suspended bridge have the solid rod that the Brooklyn Bridge have. This is the cable goes on the knees of the railway, carrying the railway and just suspend the railway. But it's like on the knees of the trusses, that is the solid rod is suspended. So that right there make that bridge very unique. And uh, we do have, like I said, an implement a lubrication, special lubrication for cable A, B, C, D for all 232 rods that is there. And um, um, well, what I can say that it makes yeah. more unique. That's besides um, yeah, that's great. the planks, the planks also that we replace, uh, we replace the planks and keep very close eye on it because of the heavy pedestrian traffic that is carried. That's great. 
That's great. Thank you. Um, so um, I know we have here experts on um, John and Washington, um, but I'm fascinated by Emily, um, who isn't personally represented here, but everybody knows about her. Um, in, in reading up here, I also read, I had no idea that she went and got a law degree at some point later in life, which um, strangely enough, I believe my mother went and got a law degree and was almost the same age as Emily when she got her law degree, which is fascinating. Um, I always think of her as an engineer, um, but, but I'm very interested in kind of the role that women played in higher education back then. And um, I wanted to ask uh, again, Erica and, and Richard, um, who know the family story so well, what Emily's role as project manager, which we've talked about, not as the visionary, not as necessarily the designer, but as managing the day-to-day -day implementation of the project. What does the, the, the important role that she played um, say about the sort of civil engineering profession at that time? Um, she didn't really have technical training. Um, and so I'm just wondering how, how you too um, view her and how she grew into that role and executed it. Can I start sure. off, Richard? Sure. Um, a, cu a couple of things I'm a, um, I will say about that law degree, and this speaks to the education of women at the time, I'm assuming that your mother's law degree enabled her to actually practice law. That's right. It and did. Emily's law degree did not. Um, really? Yeah, it was it was a sort of law degree designed for women to give them some knowledge that would be useful, probably to help their husbands. Um, it wasn't what we think of as a law degree now, because that's how things were then. Um, but she was someone who, for her time, had been very well educated. Her older brother, G.K. Warren, was Washington's commanding officer in the American Civil War and ensured that she had a, a pretty good education for someone of her time. Um, and she, once Washington became sick, um, she was the only person that he would see. And as regards her not having technical training, again, it's worth remarking that civil engineering as a profession was really something brand new. And Washington Roebling in having a degree from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute was very unusual. One of his best assistants, Colonel William Payne, had no degree in engineering, you know, learned engineering in the saddle. That's kind of mostly how it happened then. And so there, there were other engineers that had degrees. So Emily did have an extraordinary education, taking down Washington's dictation hour after hour, day after day, month after month, so that she could then communicate with his lieutenants and the other people working on the bridge. Um, it's difficult. It is difficult to know exactly her contribution because there is in fact not much record of it as it was happening at the time because they were together all the time. Um, there isn't there isn't so much in the archives or as much as we would want, but she absolutely was vital. And later in his life, she died. She predeceased Roebling, Washington Roebling. She died in 1903. And he was always punctilious about saying how important she was in the construction of the bridge. That's great. Anything you want to add, Richard, to that? Um, yeah, I mean, I think I, I mean, Erica's completely correct that the, 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 there is everyone loves this story that Emily built the Brooklyn Bridge and there's there's very little real evidence that she built the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, we do what we do know is, as Erica said, she was a sort of consummate politician um, and rather she did. She definitely did some communication as a sort of um, buffer between um, Washington and his lieutenants on the bridge site. 
her most important contribution is a, is a buffer between Washington and the Board of Trustees. Uh, Washington did not suffer falls very gladly and was not in a, I mean, he lived in his father's shadow for years, was probably incredibly annoyed about this, um, and then took on his father's project, became disabled as a result. By the end of the sort of, by the end of the building of the bridge, he's really cranky um, and he's not really uh, in a mood to sort of deal with a bunch of uh, overseers on the board of trustees. Um, and the board of trustees at one point lead, uh, Seth Lowe, who um, uh, was uh, mayor of New York at one point and mayor of Brooklyn, um, uh, leads a sort of mean-spirited attempt to oust him towards the end of the building of the bridge. And uh, if Washington had been left to his own devices, he'd have been kicked out because he was not in, he was not someone to play well with others in that regard. Um, Emily completely saved that. Um, and she, she, she ran interference with the board of trustees for years and, and was his main sort of um, negotiator with the board of trustees. And he would yell at her and she would go off and politely talk to the board of, board of trustees and get them on his on her side. If it, if, if it wasn't for Emily, Washington would have not ended up as uh, the chief engineer of the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, the Roebling name would have been more tenuously associated with the bridge. Um, in, in that regard, she is... She was hugely important. Um, but in terms of the sort of engineering, I think it's also worthwhile thinking of, uh, of the team that is in place. Um, Emily also knows how to deal with Washington. Washington is the guy with all the sort of ideas uh, and he knows what he's doing. Uh, but again, he's cranky and he, he's not well. Um, and so Emily's ability to sort of deal with him and then communicate with the people on the bridge site. Um, and the lieutenants on the bridge site, these are people who had worked on the Cincinnati and Covington Bridge, um, who had graduated from Rensselaer Polytechnic. This was a crack team of bridge suspension bridge engineers on the site. So you've got a man at the top who's got, who know, who's got a brain built for suspension bridges. Um, his wife, who's able to do a lot of the politicking and a lot of the communicating, um, and then a crack team of, team of people on the ground. And that's really how the bridge gets built. Um, you know, it's funny, you, you, you mentioned the Board of Trustees, and just for those folks who maybe don't know necessarily, uh, aren't as geeky as some of us about government and, and structures and, and how infrastructure projects get um, built, which is an ugly kind of subject. Um, but, but I guess the, the question I wanted to ask, particularly to, 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 to you, Richard and Erica, as historians, is, is just to remind us how important the construction of the bridge was to, and I won't call it the city of New York because we've already mentioned there was a city of Brooklyn and a city of New York and they weren't yet united. In fact, I don't think they were united until about 1898. So we're, we're some ways off from when New York actually um, was incorporated as a city with the five boroughs. But um, there was a character, Boss Tweed, Tammany Hall, there was a machine kind of running the city and how this bridge, bridge company and this project related to that is a sort of subset of that uh, question about the importance of this project to the city as a whole. And I, I just wonder, since we're in the world of big projects today and talking about Penn Station and new tunnels under the Hudson River, maybe you guys could just give us a sense of what it meant for the politicians. Um, I can I can, I, I can answer, I think there's two, there's two questions there in, in one. Um, the importance of the Brooklyn Bridge to the city of New York is huge. Um, and I, there wouldn't, well, I mean, the beginnings of the cons the, 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 the conversation about con the consolidation of the five boroughs in 1898, as you talk about, begins when the Brooklyn Bridge is open, is opened. You have, uh, on the day the bridge is open, the newspapers are full of, now that New York and Brooklyn are linked physically, why don't we should start thinking about linking this region politically? Um, and that conversation, the opening of the bridge begins that conversation, which leads to the creation of the city of New York. So um, how important is it? Well, it's a huge factor in that. Um, and in terms of the development of New York as a city, it's, it's a, a huge, it's hugely important in the terms of the transportation um, infrastructure of the city um, and demographic history of the city. Um, it's a pain to get into Manhattan in the 19th century. You have to get on a ferry. Uh, if it freezes, if the weather's bad, uh, you have to, it's, it's, it's annoying to get in. Once you get a bridge, you can open up Brooklyn. People start to live in Brooklyn. Brooklyn expands from 
really a sort of series of villages in the mid 19th century to the fourth largest city in the US by the time it's consolidated. Uh, that is because people can live there and get into, into Manhattan to work. Um, and that only happens with the building of the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, so in, in, in those two regards, there's a thousand ways in which uh, the Brooklyn Bridge is important to the city of New York. In those two sort of basic ways, it's it's hugely important. Um, and I don't know if Erica wants to add to this. I can talk about Boss Tweed a little bit as well, if you'd like. Well, I was, I was, I thought I'd well, try, probably talk about so I'd take over sure. a little on, on Tweed. And it's just, just to say that um, building, um, you know, as, as Clara certainly will know, building massive construction projects is always thorny. Um, the Brooklyn Bridge was begun during a time of astonishing corruption in the city of New York in the reign of Boss Tweed, um, William McGeer Tweed, he was called, and he was the Democratic, um, he was the boss of the Democratic Party and um, his whole history we can't really go into, but anyone who built anything um, was expected to kick him back enormous sums of money. It's kind of astonishing that pretty much the bridge escaped becoming embroiled in the Tweed ring. He, he fell, um, he fell from his pinnacle of position. A bookkeeper eventually got pissed off at him um, and revealed what was going on in the Tweed ring. And I think now, I think it was 1872, um, that he kind of met his political end, at which point um, the, the bridge became, it had been built by the trustees were the trustees of a private company, the New York Bridge Company. Um, after the fall of Tweed, it was moved to being um, a, a public enterprise of the cities. So the trustees came from the cities as they were then of New York and Brooklyn. Um, and absolutely, as Richard was saying, the bridge was instrumental in the eventual creation of Greater New York. That's well, it's worth mentioning briefly as well. Tweed was one of the original trustees of the bridge, yes. um, right. and he got stock on he got stock in the bridge because he facilitated the legislation that that created the bridge. Uh, but he met his downfall in the middle of the thing. I mean, it's the building of the Brooklyn Bridge is sort of also in that point where that sort of old style Tammany politics was sort of on the wane, and sort of people were trying to shine a, a sort of uh, lens on how things were done. So it, it is part of that process and is, and is part of how that process gets cleaned up. I don't know if it ever really gets fully cleaned up, um, but, but there's a sort of a, a process where clarity becomes super important in how, in how large projects get built. Right. And of course, it's fascinating because the bridge opened and this is off topic, but at this point, people are lobbying for a subway. And of course, when the subway franchises go out soon after, the subway didn't open until 1904, they are they are private, um, they're very much so private um, and very competitive between them. So uh, it's very interesting that the Brooklyn Bridge became this public asset at, at, at that early stage when it was still very much the private sector that, you mm -hmm. know, of the commercial risk. Um, Clara, I have a question. This, this is sort of taking us back to the, the history and just the huge um, um, scope of history that the bridge has seen. I read somewhere that um, I, I guess even as a public enterprise, it still needed money. And so that at one point, some, I, I may get this wrong, but some of the vaults under the bridge were used to um, store wine or alcohol and there was rent paid by whoever the users were because I guess it was nice um, and cool under there um, and that there those uh, arches those vaults whatever they are have had other uses as well fallout shelters I don't know what um, and so I'm just wondering if you could if you know what other uses the bridge has seen um, other than transportation and whether there are any today that are particularly interesting that we're allowed to know about. I'm sure there might be some we're not allowed to know about, but um, maybe you could tell us. Well, no, when Rowling built the bridge back then, he, he imagined that he will create space that could be utilized for merchants. 
And this way he can renew, like gain some money to, to cover the spends for the maintenance of the bridge. Um, and uh, like you say, the space in the basements, they are very um, convenient because there was a lot of ventilation that the, the, the stumps keep cold through the, during the year, through the whole year. That's why they use it for the wine cellar. And uh, it's still call it the wine cellar to that address. And um, so, but beyond the use of the wine set or the wine, those cellars for, for wines, also they were serviced through others, like during the cold wall, the bridge were designed for fallout uh, shelters and uh, to stack supplies in case of the nuclear attack. And um, today as a current, we are in the middle of a major rehabilitation for those arches. So right now it's... Okay, that's, that's great. Thank you so much. Um, I didn't realize they were still sort of wine cellars. Um, uh, no, no, just the name, not, no, nothing yeah. is in there. Just right now is in the middle of, like I say, of major rehabilitations. Right, 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 right. Um, I'm just thinking if we can get into, um, uh, to, to one last question or not. Um, and, and Clara, just a, just a quickie before we open it up to others. I wonder as a bridge engineer, if the, if the bridge were to be built today um, to connect Brooklyn and Manhattan in that place, how might it look different? Well, right now uh, will be more technology, definitely allowing a stronger cables, longer spans, uh, giving more environmental sensitivities. The first design will be maybe evaluated, will be probably Cable State Bridge, similar to Kosciuszko Bridge. Um, well, maybe we'll have since technology, maybe sensors, so we can monitor the, our uh, future engineer can monitor the, uh, the health of the bridge the behave of the bridge. So um, uh, definitely we'll have a pedestrian bike path to encourage uh, no motorcycle people. Uh, transportation in addition to um, to the, uh, like to integrate in addition to the public uh, transportation. So like bikes and, and any other device. So I will say it will be a, a bridge people friendly. Right. Uh, maybe, way, maybe not as beautiful, but but well, not. because this is have a combination of history of frustration from the main constructors at the beginning, uh, like like Richard and Erica say before, is 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 a lot of history behind this bridge, a lot of challenges that this is designers and the and the, the, the master main of this bridge. And then, um, so it's like this, this bridge represented like the design and visionary mastermind behind, which is, yeah. I will say it is the father, the resistance, which is the son and represent the strength, Emily, because all those three combined uh, factors make that bridge also added to the engineering design, very unique, the history combined and make that bridge like unforgettable That's for great. most of the people who can see it. That's great. Um, I think it's time to open it up to some of the questions from um, uh, everybody in attendance here. Um, um, some of them are, uh, they're, they're quite pointed. So let's start with some of the um, questions back, back in time. Um, uh, the first one is a question, um, maybe we'll direct it at, at you, Richard, is um, a question about the original footing designs by John. Um, it's a question from Hal, and he wonders whether there were any changes needed over time. And I open this up to any of the three of you. I don't want to assume that you know the answer, Richard, um, but he's interested in whether the original footing designs changed. The footing, I'm sorry? You said the, the foot walk? The footings of yeah. the of the of the bridge i i'm not sure what i'm what what do you mean by the footing 
No, neither do I. Well, the foot in is should be like the base of. of so of, the found the foundations. The foundation something. The gallery. Said, yes, right. Uh, if all if it's the foot walk, yes, it was replaced for original concept in nineteen. No, 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 I think I think it's, it's the footing. No, it's it's uh it's being reinforced. The arch they call it Franklin Arch on Pell Street. Okay, but um, uh, other than that, it's um it's it's the foundation is still. Okay, there's a kind of related questions from Christina, which is who made the decision to stop digging down to bedrock on the Manhattan side tower? Was it Emily or Washington? I'm it not was sure. Washington, it was Washington Roebling who made that decision in May of 1872. And, and can you tell us my, why I don't know that much about it? One of my um, favorite artifacts in the collection of RPI um, is um, a, a piece of bedrock. It's about sort of two inches long and an inch wide. And it has Washington's handwriting on it. And it says 78 feet, six inches. And that's when bedrock was nearly, but the striking thing is not quite reached. Because if you wanted to get to bedrock on the New York side, you would probably have had to bore down to about 100 or 106 feet from the test borings that they had done before the construction um, had started. But that was really, really deep back then. And people were getting sick, and it was very expensive. And what they were digging through was also really really tough material. It was sort of bending iron crowbars. Washington was unusual in that, as well as being an engineer, he was also a passionate geologist. And this is important to this story because what he was able to recognize was that at 78 feet, six inches, there were spurs of bedrock that were spiky. As he wrote, they had not been smoothed by the rounding action of water or ice. So he judged that nothing down there had moved for at least 100,000 years. So he called the digging to be stopped. And it was, but it's sort of worth remarking, therefore, that the New York Tower, strictly speaking, does not stand on bedrock. Bedrock. That is and, and that was Washington's decision. And again, I, you know, I think that's so extraordinary to think that really that was one person's decision and mm -hmm. everything depended on that. And wow. one afternoon, that's what he decided to do. Wow. Yeah, there was, I um, mean, at no, at, at Washington was the only person who could make that choice because it's such a monumental choice. I don't think anyone, because he's a geologist, um, Emily would have, Emily wouldn't have, did not have the expertise to make that sort of decision, and none of the none of the people, none of the lieutenants, did either. Um, it's sort of a, a unique combination of being an, an engineer and a geologist that allowed Washington. I mean, it's it's an incredible decision. Um, it's such a huge engineering feat to decide. Well, hey ho, let's see if we can stand on some sand. Um, but he was uniquely qualified to make that. I don't know what John would have done. That's that's an interesting question. Fascinating. Um, this is a question I'm not sure who can answer, but it's a question from Piper, who's age eight, and Asher, is eight, who's age six, who walk over the bridge to school in the morning. They can see open doorways on the top of the towers on the inner side. They're not sure that they lead anywhere, but are wondering how the workers get to those doorways without ladders and where they go. So I'll I, just repeat those it. Little, those and I, because Clara can probably, there used to be peregrine falcons nesting. Yes, it, and uh, the Discovery Channel, the History Channel put a chip. No, but yes, but besides that is, that is uh, that is small opening there. Uh, cannot be reached only from the side. And uh, it's, 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 uh, it's the inspectors when they go there, uh, they go there and then they go across 
the towels from one side to another to inspect because there's no other way to go into the... So how do they get there? Do they... Uh, they have, uh, you know, like a harness uh, flat or with the main lift. Also, they go. Before, they had a scaffold during the construction um, last year. But they they um, they go now with a ladder. Fascinating. And not from the cables either. You cannot walk to the cables to go down there. So you have to be very unique. However, it can be with a main lift, uh, can be with um, the floats, um, harness um, that they, right. the inspectors can use. Wow. I'm not acrophobic. The part. Yeah, not, not for people like me who are acrophobic. Um, a question from Gabriel. Um, was the ultimate cost of the bridge anywhere close to the estimate? Of course not. It was about twice. It was about twice the original estimate. John John Roebling, I think was was it seven million, Richard? And then fifteen. Well, it it, it uh, you know uh, he his first plan for the bridge was in um, the eighteen fifties, and then in the in the mid eighteen fifties, then eighteen the late eighteen fifties, and then early eight, so and, and the price went up every year. Um, but his, his, I think his estimate was seven point something um, in the late 60s when the actual plan was started. I think his first estimate was about two million, but that was um, something he wrote in a newspaper trying to get a contract. So um, these things are always, uh, as Clara will know, they're always a lot more expensive at the end. Actually, um, that is a less than today will be five times or seven times the price. At least he did two times only. Yeah, and I, I think it's worth it's worth, certainly worth mentioning, as Erica said, that you know these small changes. Um, they, they were doing something almost completely new. Who who the hell knew how much the case on work was going to really cost? Uh, there's just simply no way to compare it to any work that had been done before. Right. Um, you talked about all the experts that were kind of putting their heads together and how to do this. There's a couple questions that Gabriel also had about the workers who actually were involved in building the bridge um, and whether they were paid, uh, this is my words, not not his or hers, a, a, a fair wage. And if they got hurt, did anybody pay for their medical care? So I think it's just a, a general question about how labor was organized on the bridge and how, um, how good these jobs were or weren't. We know they were dangerous, but beyond that, um, maybe you guys have some feedback. Gen that. Generally in those days, that kind of work was not very well <laughs> rewarded and very little care was given to the workers. Okay. It's one of the reasons it's very difficult to know. There is some record of who was injured and who was killed on the site. But if you walked away from the bridge and felt sick and didn't come back, there wasn't much record kept of that. Having said that, um, when people, including himself, of course, started to get sick, from what was then called caisson disease and is now called decompression sickness or the bends, um, Washington did hire a doctor, a man called Andrew Smith, um, who looked after the men and almost, but not quite figured out what was causing caisson disease, which is a kind of counterintuitive illness because people feel that surely the thing must be to get quickly out of the compressed air. And of course, that's exactly the opposite of what anyone has to do as anyone who's maybe been scuba diving now knows. So there was some care, um, but not great care over time. Um, shifts, sh work, you know, work shifts were shortened and the men were paid more. Um, but it's not a job I would have liked to have. No, it was it was incredibly dangerous in all sorts of ways. There's no there's no netting if you're working on the towers. Uh, there's no unemployment insurance. There's no workman's comp. There's none of these things. Um, they they get they were paid a basically a laborer's prevailing wage. Um, nothing, no more, no less. Um, they when it was at certain certain point they tried to I think sort of either go on strike but they were just threatened with being fired and that's right uh, it was right. not it's not it was not terribly um uh effective. aggressive um and um 
and I, I think I, the thing I always find the most sort of moving about this is how many people were really kind of devoted to working on the bridge. It was not well paid. It was very dangerous, but people seemed to work on it like they were committed to it as a as a thing. Um, and a lot of people, I mean, people will say, oh, how many people died on the building of the Brooklyn Bridge? And I don't think we know exactly, but it's it, the question is more how many people were disabled or uh, received, like mm -hmm. lost a finger or a, or something like that in the bridge. And it, you could you could lose a limb. You could have some serious problems that would really stop you from working again um, in your life. And there was probably a lot of those. A lot of uh, victims of the Benz, uh, like Washington, were sort of... It, ended up in a wheelchair um, and they didn't they did not have Washington's family fortune or anything else to keep them going so it's it's really is a, it's a testament to a lot of engineering skill and a lot of devotion but also to a lot of labor uh, right. that sort of put themselves in harm's way right. uh, uh, funny you mentioned uh, Richard the family fortune um, there was a question which I was going to ask but ran out of time about the Roebling Steel Company um, and, and Mark has asked the question, can you address the relationship of the Roebling Steel Company and the politics around them providing steel for the bridge? Um, maybe you can just explain what the Roebling Steel Company was so everybody understands. Uh, John, John Roebling started a company uh, that he, John Roebling sort of, the family business was built, was manufacturing wire rope. Um, and, but wire rope and rope for wire cables. Um, and uh, he built this, uh, company before he sort of got into the suspension bridge game and he set up a factory in Trenton um, and did very well at it. He, it was an ongoing concern so he actually he didn't make his money as a suspension bridge engineer uh, he made his money as a manufacturer and an inventor. Um, it was under his sons who inherited the business after John died that it boomed and became this huge um, corporation in the 20th century sort of effectively taking over almost all of Trenton. Um, there, there's some sort of, there's a lot of sort of controversy about this in terms of the, um, the um, during the manufacture of this, the, um, Abraham Hewitt, who uh, was one of the trustees after it became from a private to a public venture, uh, made a resolution as a board of trustees that no one in the engine, no one involved in the engineering of the bridge could bid on the cables or, or any of the, or any of the things on the cable. So, um, Washington Roebling was the best suspension bridge engineer at the time, and his company supplied the best suspension cables in the world, but they were not allowed to bid on that. Um, Washington ended up discovering, someone else uh, got the contract, um, and he discovered that they were sort of uh, cheating the company. They, would, they, would, they, they made some wire cables that would pass inspection, and then it would pass inspection, and then go back to the factory, and they would uh, shuffle some uh, bad quality wire in, um, and so uh, it it's, it was a, one of those sort of pushed up but controversial parts of, of the construction. And eventually, this was found out. The Roebling family got the contract to finish the cables. Um, Sorry, they did. They did, in fact, um, but they they did, in fact, bid um, on the contract because Washington sold all of his shares in his own company. So that's that's what happened first is because following the Tweed um, scandal, um, Hewitt said no one can bid. So Washington disassociated himself um, grumpily, as he did most things from his family fortune. But they still did not initially um, initially get get that contract. Fascinating. Um, and then just to wrap up, we've got time for just one more quick question. Um, Car, there is a, a, a couple questions just about the the cleaning of the bridge and when that will be finished, and a question about the vaults and what will they be used for when the rehab work is finished. I don't know if you want to just quickly uh, give us an update well, on that. Uh, the um, the cleaning is never going to finish. Oh no, you say when it's done. Uh, well, the, it, 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 oh, there is no, we just did the rehabilitation of the tower, the stone, gran the granite stones, just now, recently, in 2022. Um, so you can see now the color, no more brown. Now it's, it's a shine uh, gray color. And uh, like I said before, current, uh, in the actuality right now, we are in the middle of a major rehab for those uh, valves. So 
until everything is complete and done, the city will decide what to do with them. But at this moment, it's just a construction going on for rehab. And uh, what was the other question? No, that's it. You pretty much answered it, that we don't know what's going to happen until everything's done. Richard, you Yes. Know? I was just going to say uh, that, uh, that there used to be uh, a wonderful art space, Art in the Anchorage, and they used to have uh, art in there, and they used to have music shows. I went to see Sonic Youth in there. Um, and that was in the nineties and it was, and it was, it was a very, it was run by creative time. It was a super, super vibrant sort of art space, uh, there. And then it was shut down after nine 11 because it was thought to be a sort of terrorist risk. Um, but I, I, if anyone, if anyone from the mayor's office is out there, um, it would be great to open those up again. There yeah, was a lovely that was amazing. space. Um, and you know, if not, great. there's a lot of potential there. Great. Um, well, I want to just take this opportunity to thank our panel to thank um, Clara from DOT and Richard and Erica, our experts on the, the Roebling family. Um, I've learned so much just preparing for this and listening in. And I just want to turn it over to Marsha to, to wrap up. You know, what a wonderful conversation. And I want to thank you, Kate, for leading it. Um, it's really feels very special to have all of you be uh, here together talking about this extraordinary icon on this anniversary. Um, and it's been a great pleasure, honor. I've learned a lot uh, to host this. And uh, I just thank you so much, all of you, for a really informative, incredibly interesting time flew by conversation. So thank you. And thank all of you for coming. Um, this has been recorded and we'll post it on the YouTube channel for the Center for Brooklyn History Public Programs. Um, and on that note, I hope everyone has a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thanks. Take care. Good night, Good night, night all. Good night. Bye -bye. And thanks.